Okay, so a legendary producer who was only a few years removed from writing and performing eight top 10 hits with his own band was producing uh, another Legends 1987 comeback album. The comeback would be big. Two huge hits from the album. Well, the two legends were talking one day and they decided they'd put together a supergroup. They both agreed to find one person that they admired, bring him and uh, record a record. However, in the process, they ended up bringing in three legends for a total of five. They created one of the greatest albums of the 80s. Up next, we're going to tell the story how four of these legends were so mesmerized by their bandmate, they all stopped everything they were doing whenever he would record his part. Also, the tragedy that followed their debut album. Great story coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Now, if you've ever waited on uh, pins and needles for your favorite artist's new album to drop, you know, back in the day before digital music, you're sure gonna enjoy this channel. Make sure that you subscribe below right now to get our daily content. And check out our new merch at professorofrock.com or at the link below. And make sure to look us up on Patreon for another catalog of content that helps this channel keep going. I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses that I jam every single day. You know, one of the best things about Zenny, these glasses, that uh, when you go to zenny.com, you can customize your eyewear with a prescription lens or non-prescription lens. You can get sunglasses, whatever. If you just want the cool look or a certain color, a particular style of lens, you can do that. Check it out today at zenny.com. So over the rock era, there have been... Uh, Several supergroups, you know, superstar artists that teamed up with other superstars to put their uh, collective talent together and created an all-world band. You know, there's Cream, Blind Faith, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Bad Company, Asia, The Highwaymen, Temple of the Dog, and them Crooked Vultures are, you know, just the ones that leap to mind. The supergroup that was arguably the most stacked coterie ever assembled, in my opinion, was a traveling Wilburys. Got somebody to lean on. It was an unbelievable convergence of rock royalty. I mean, Bob Dylan, George Harrison, Tom Petty, Jeff Lynne, and the great Roar Orbison. The most difficult prospect for getting all that incredible talent on one cohesive course would be you know, managing their egos. I mean, let's face it, rock stars have gigantic egos. Pretty much comes with the territory, and they should. So checking your Amir prop uh, at the studio door would be imperative in order to achieve some kind of camaraderie. What made the Traveling Wilburys come together for such a historic union was because the five luminaries truly got along so well. Uh, each artist genuinely cared for their fellow bandmates, even referring to them as brothers. Uh, of course, they had an immense respect for one another as well. George Harrison was the ringleader that made it all happen. He was the connective tissue to all four of his bandmates, having met each of them prior to forming Traveling Wilburys. Situations terrible. The notion to create such a group started, I guess, with a lighthearted conversation between George Harrison and Jeff Lynn. This is when the two were working together on George's album, Cloud Nine, in 1987. Of course, with the number one hit, I Got My Mind Set On You. I got my mind set on you. I got my mind set. It was a couple of months into the recording sessions for Cloud9 when uh, Harrison presented the idea of the two of them forming a band together. Right off the bat, they had fun with that idea. It was decided that uh, both of them could choose only one artist to invite to join the band, presumably any artist that they wanted. I wonder if they thought of other people. Anyway, uh, Harrison chose Bob Dylan. Well, Jeff Lynne's pick was Roy Orbison. Collectively, they also selected Tom Petty since they both loved Tom. As Jeff Lynne tells it, Dylan and Orbison immediately agreed to join the supergroup, and then Tom came on board uh, only a few minutes. Uh, the Fantastic Five were assembled just like that. Up, shut down. 
The name Wilbury originated from those same Cloud9 sessions. Uh, Jeff and George encountered some technical issues with equipment in the studio when they were joking around about how to get around the faulty gear. George quipped, uh, we'll bury him in the mix. That remark led to Harrison suggesting they call their fantasy group the Trembling Wilburys. Lynn suggested they change the name to Traveling Wilburys, and so it was. Uh, the next move was from Warner Brothers, when legendary WB chairman Mo Austin asked George to record a new song to serve as the B-side for the third single off Cloud9. Uh, that was planned for European distribution. Jeff Lynn and Roy Orbison were having dinner, and Jeff asked Roy to help him record the requested track. Uh, George was halfway finished with the song, and Roy Orbison, George Harrison, and Jeff Lynn went to uh, Dylan's miniature studio in Malibu to complete it. Now, George knew that Bob Dylan had, you know, that studio, and he rung him. Uh, even though Dylan could be very hard to get a hold of, as George Harrison would say, uh, sometimes it would take weeks, even months. Remember, this is before cell phones. He did get Dylan straight away, and he eagerly invited them to come on down. Now, at that point, Jeff Lynn had met Tom, but he didn't know him well. Uh, he met Bob a couple of times, but hadn't met Roy before asking him to join the group. Up to that point, it was something Jeff only dreamed about. He was a huge fan of Roy Orbison while he was growing up listening to his music. Roy Orbison had actually toured the UK with the Beatles in 1963, as many of you probably know along with Jerry and the Pacemakers and several other artists on that bill. Roy was actually supposed to headline, uh, be the headlining act, but the Beatles were at their rise and it was promoted as uh, co-headliners. I mean, can you even imagine Roy Orbison and the Beatles, the Beatles and Roy Orbison, just incredible. According to Roy, when he was asked by Beatles manager Brian Epstein to tour England with the Beatles, he said, what's a Beatle? Uh, Roy's hot off his classics like uh, Crying and Only the Lonely and his star was rising fast in the UK. But he had never heard of the band. He'd never heard of the Fab Four. It was his first tour of the UK, didn't really know what to expect. Lonely, the lonely. However, the president of the Roy Orbison fan club wrote him a letter explaining that touring with the Beatles would be a great thing for him. They were, of course, number one in England and would get him more exposure. The Beatles definitely knew who Roy Orbison was. The Fab Four absolutely worshipped him. Um, actually, the band's first number one hit, Please Please Me, was directly inspired by Only the Lonely. However, by the time Roy came to the UK for his first tour, the Beatles had uh, eclipsed him in popularity, for sure. Roy graciously agreed to being cold billed and uh, the Beatles closed out each night. But Roy was uh, a tough act to follow. Beatles were just blown away by his nightly performances. In fact, George Harrison would say years before working with Roy Orbison in the Traveling Wilburys that he had so many hit songs and people could sit and listen to him all night. He didn't have to do anything. He didn't have to wiggle his legs. In fact, he never even twitched. He was like a marble. The only things that moved were his lips. This is. Harrison's exact quote about it. Uh, he said, even when he hit those high notes, he never strained. He was quite a miracle, unique. George and the boys would sit behind the curtain thinking, uh, how are we going to follow this? Now, George Harrison, had, of course, run into Bob Dylan many times, first time being in 1964, so they knew each other pretty well. One of the memorable times that George Harrison met Dylan was at Columbia Studio B in New York City in 1970 to work on Dylan's LP, New Morning. This was just weeks after the world got the shocking news that the Beatles were breaking up. Petty met Dylan for the first time backstage, I guess after Bob's show at the Universal Amphitheater in L.A. in 1978. The first time guitar George met Tom Petty was at Leon Russell's house in L.A. That was back in 1974 during the release of Harrison's fifth studio album, Dark Horse. In Dylan's tiny studio on the beach, all of the traveling Wilburys recorded the track after uh, Guitar George had come up with a few lines, uh, and he was kind of figuring out the song. I guess Bob Dylan asked the question, what is this? What are we going to call this? And George Harrison at that time noticed a warning label on a box in his garage, and it read, Handle with Care. 
That was that. When Austin and his WB colleague Lenny Wanaker heard Handle with Care, they were breathless with excitement. I can't even imagine it. The two executives thought the track was uh, far too good to be a B-side. That ultimately led to the formation of the Traveling Wilburys right then and there with all five members working on a full album together. Um, Handle with Care was the first cut on the Volume 1 album and the first single by the Wilburys. The song just uh, epitomized what the world would come to expect from this band. I've been Harrison would sing the verses with just aching resolve before giving way to the great Roy Orbison who brought down the house. In fact, Jeff Lynne, Tom Petty, George Harrison, and Bob Dylan, all legends, they had so much respect, so much love for Roy and his pure tenor voice. I mean, whenever Roy was going to sing his part, every single one of them would drop everything that they were doing. And they just listen at full attention and just uh, shake their heads in amazement at, at the talent. I love the ending of the song. You know, although George had pretty much written all the lyrics for Handle With Care, along with most of the other songs on the album, the writing credits list all five members. That was uh, just a prime example of how selfless the Traveling Wilburys collaboration was and what reinforced how special it was. Uh, the collaboration was born out of, like you said, a love of music and really to have a good time. They just loved each other's company with that respect. Petty Orbison, Dylan, Harrison, and Lynn really enjoyed working with each other. There was really no leader of the pack. Even though George was, like I said, the mastermind behind the project, he certainly wasn't a dictator. Uh, you know, somebody who made everyone follow his agenda. So each of the five members wrote, sang, and produced for the band on every track. If you live the life you please, well, it's all right. It was a refreshing, creative escape for the Wilbury Five to try out you know, different concepts that they perhaps could, you know, would have been unable to do with their solo careers, or in Petty's case, an opportunity that wouldn't have materialized with the Heartbreakers either. Band members even adopted uh, those hilarious pseudonyms to reinforce the brotherly kinship of the group. The nicknames were, of course, derived from a fictional Wilbury family of traveling musicians that toured religiously to soothe the woes of the world. It's funny because they never toured, but Bob Dylan was Lucky, uh, George Harrison was Nelson, Jeff Lynn's alias was Otis, or Orbison was Lefty to honor his idol Lefty Frizzell. And Petty's full pseudonym was Charles T. Jr. Wilbury. Traveling Wilbury's Volume 1 was largely recorded over just 10 days in May of 88 in order to allow for Dylan's limited availability before he began his never-ending tour. Uh, ironically, as big as the names uh, Dylan, Orbison, and Petty were, Traveling Wilburys actually helped revive their respective careers. I mean, think about it. In 1989, a year after the release of Traveling Wilburys Volume 1, uh, Bob Dylan's album, Oh Mercy, that became his best-selling record in many, many years. We live in a political world. I hanging down. And Petty put out his epic debut solo album, Full Moon Fever, in which Jeff Lynne produced, including his biggest hit ever. Now, for Roy Orbison, he was a veritable hit machine in the 60s, but... Uh, Traveling Wilburys put him back in the uh, contemporary psyche, if you will. He hadn't had a hit since that Loving You Feeling Again duet with Emmy Lou Harris that was in 1980. It had been a long time. And loving you feeling. Because of the success of the Wilburys and the heavy play of the music video for Handle with Care on MTV, Roy Orbison was hot again. Sadly, uh, Roy would not live to experience just how big his comeback would be. Uh, he died of a massive heart attack at his mother's home on December 6th, 1988. He was only 52 years old. Such a loss. Uh, just always rem uh, think about how much more great music would Roy have produced uh, up to now. Roy's solo album, Mystery Girl, was released uh, after his death in January of 89. Uh, and it featured the single, You Got It. And that was co-written by Tom Petty and Jeff Lynne. Anything at all, you got it. 
album shot to number five on the Billboard 200, and you got it was a multi-format smash. It climbed to number nine on the Billboard Hot 100, number seven on the Hot Country chart, number two on the Mainstream Rock chart, and it actually topped the AC chart. Everyone was just elated for the beloved Roy Orbison and for his huge comeback. It's just so unfortunate that he wasn't alive to experience such an amazing rejuvenation of his artistic genius. I'm so grateful, though, that the, uh, the legends that were inspired by Roy Orbison, many of them were able to honor him uh, when he was alive with Black and White Night. If you haven't seen that, go check that out. It's amazing. You can stream it, I believe. Only the lonely. Handle with Care was uh, magical as the lead single for the Traveling Wilburys with the unmistakable vocals from those iconic rock stars singing together on the heavenly chorus. The song was as great as one would ever imagine it could be. Everybody got somebody to leave. And George Harrison was in stellar form when he played those inspired guitar riffs as, as if they stepped into a time machine. It took him back 20 years. George and Roy, uh, of course, performed the lead vocal on the verses for Handle With Care. Never sounded better. Let's hear it again. Hey, I'm so tired of being... And it was so perfect what Harrison wrote, because it really honored Roy, you know, with his line, I'm so tired of being lonely. Of course, a tip of the hat to one of his signature songs, Only the Lonely. And then when he sings, uh, I still have some love to give as if uh, Roe is telling the world that though he'd been away from the limelight for a long time, he was not finished. George Harrison's lyrics fit the group perfectly, writing to their age, uh, instead of you know writing for a hit song. It's truly autobiographical to the reality of aging and entering a different phase of their career after decades of success for all of them, uh, except maybe Tom Petty. Especially when, you know, he says, been stuck in airports, terrorized, set to meanings, hypnotized, overexposed, commercialized. Overexposed, commercialized. It's very telling when they say, I've been uptight and made a mess, but I'll clean up myself, I guess. Oh, the sweet smell of success. Yes. Oh, the sweet smell of success. Handle me with care. Talk about the perfect summation of these legends' never-ending careers, just, just eternal. The Handle With Care was a number two track at uh, Mainstream Rock. It was a top 30 hit at AC, and it went to number 45 on the Billboard Hot 100. It should have done better. Uh, internationally, the single had top five success in Australia, uh, New Zealand, Ireland, and, um, oh, Canada. The track End of the Line was the second single released from Volume 1 with all but Dylan taking turn to lead vocals. End of the Line, that also reached number two on the mainstream rock chart. Well, it's all right. We're going to the end of the night. And actually, the Traveling Wilburys achieved a hat trick at the album rock radio format when the third single uh, from Volume 1, Heading for the Light, that peaked at number seven on the mainstream rock chart. Heading for the Light had a jangly Harrison guitar groove and George assumed lead vocal duties, but you do hear Jeff Lynne's gift for building vocal harmonies much more prominently on that particular track. Following Roy Orbison's tragic death, uh, the band were on pause for the foreseeable future. Uh, in March 1990, though, uh, George Harrison and Jeff Lynne and Tom Petty and, and Bob Dylan they did reunite once again to work on their sophomore album. It's a record that they intentionally misnumbered, skipping a mention of volume two and going right to Traveling Wilburys volume three uh, to avoid the sophomore slump was the joke. The material on volume three was presented as a dedication to Orbison or otherwise referred to as uh, Lefty Wilbury. Another touching demonstration of the, the respect and, and deep affection the Wilburys had for one another. The Traveling Wilburys, they never toured, which would have been another incredible landmark in music history, but they created music that lit us up with a rousing spirit of character, friendship, and artistic celebration. 
Harrison and Lynn did reteam in 1995 when Lynn produced and reworked uh, two John Lennon demos with the Beatles for their anthology rarities collection, including Free as a Bird. We know that Roy Orbison, George Harrison, and uh, Tom Petty have all been transported to rock and roll heaven uh, with Jeff Lynn and Bob Dylan as the lone living Wilburys. And man, do I miss these legends. I know you do too. The Traveling Wilburys Volume 1 was awarded the Grammy for Best Rock Performance by a Duo or Group in 1990, Volume 1 and 3. They've sold 8 million copies around the world, more than half of those sales coming from the United States. You know, the day this album came out, my dad bought it and he played it for weeks. We had seen, you know, the promotional stuff on MTV and VH1 and we're just counting down the days. It's funny that uh, I think one of the only times that my dad uh, watched MTV with me was at this time. I remember thinking, man, my dad is watching MTV with me. How cool is this? I mean, the day we heard the first single is a time uh, that's etched upon my soul. I mean, all of his heroes in the same song that became my heroes. It was just part of the renaissance that was the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I just don't think we'll ever have a time like that again in popular music. I hope I'm wrong. The five legends had such a blast making the music together. We're also grateful to have been invited to the party to enjoy pure inspiration that uh, will live on forever. It was the ultimate rock collaboration with five of the world's most iconic musicians sharing their joy of music, living in the moment. Leave us a comment about this ultra super group. What are your memories of this album? and uh, these songs, and who's your favorite Wilbury? Let us know in the comments. Uh, make sure to subscribe so you never miss out on our, our daily content. Don't forget to check us out on Patreon and our merch. Help us keep the music alive. It's really important. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.